Okay, now let's prove sufficiency. And let me comment that the phenomenon that we're talking about is something that comes up in combinatorics quite a bit, and that is that there's an obvious necessary condition, and the obvious necessary condition turns out to be sufficient. Now, whenever you have that phenomenon, it's, it's kind of a, it's adding an elegance, it's adding a, a certain structure and beauty to the topic that you don't always find. There's lots of situations in which life is just not so simple. There's an obvious necessary condition, but it isn't sufficient. And then from there it gets messy. It gets really hard. But here it's quite simple. All right, now we're going to prove sufficiency, and we're going to do it by induction. We're going to take a post set which does not contain a 2 plus 2, and we're going to show that it is an interval order. And we're going to do it by induction. We're going to start with a post set on one point, which does not contain a 2 plus 2. We're going to show that it's an interval order. And then we're going to proceed by induction from there. Now, is there anyone in the room who cannot prove that a one element post set is an interval order? What do you do? You write an interval down. OK? Uh, let's, just for the fun of it, let's do two. What are the two element post sets? This and that. Are they both interval orders? Here's the chain. Here's the anti-chain. OK? So the theorem that we're trying to prove if the post set does not contain a 2 plus 2, it's an interval order. It's true for small post sets. Now let's proceed by induction. So we're going to assume valid. When the size of the post set is k for some k which is greater than or equal to 1. And then we're going to do the inductive step. So now we're going to suppose that the cardinality of p is k plus 1. And p has no k plus k, uh, 2 plus 2. So there's no 2 plus 2 inside P. We're going to show that P is an interval order. All right, we're going to, again, we're going to do it by induction. So we look at the post set, here's P, and now look at the maximal elements. I'm suggesting that they look like this, but this, this picture is highly suggestive, isn't it? We've drawn post sets, and the maximal elements are all over the place. So you have to take this picture with a grain of salt. It's, it's suggesting what's going on, but this is not an accurate picture of a post set at all. All right, now, when you take any maximal element, you can calculate what's called the downset from x. In fact, you can talk about the downset for any element, whether it's a maximal element or not. It's all the y's that belong to the post set that have the property that y is less than x. That's the downset from x. So intuitively, the downset from x is this stuff. Every element has a downset. Uh, you can, an element over here has a downset. It's all this stuff. All the elements that are less than. All right, now, here's what I want you to do. Look at the post set and choose an element whose downset is as big as possible. Big in the sense of size. Pick one whose downset is as big as possible in terms of size. So choose x with 
the cardinality of down from x maximum, the biggest one in size. There is one. It's a finite poset. That element is always a maximal element. Because if it's not maximal, anybody that's over it has a bigger downset. All right, so here's the element that has the biggest downset in size. What happens if it's the only maximal element? What happens if everybody in the post set is less than x? Then the downset is everybody except itself. That's true, but take it away. I remove x. I have a smaller post set. And that doesn't contain a 2 plus 2 either. So p minus x is an interval order. So here are the intervals for p minus x. Now, if you had to add an interval for x to this picture, and you knew that x was bigger than any one of those points, could you do it? Do you have to be very clever? You could even do this if you were a graduate student at UGA. What you would do is look at all these values and choose the largest one for right endpoints. Okay. Now, that might be tied. There might be several with this largest right endpoint. And then go out past that and put X there. And that makes x bigger than everybody else. And if this captures all the order relationships in p minus x, and x is the biggest element of them all, then I'm done. So the more interesting case is that x is not the biggest element of them all, and that certain elements are incomparable with x. Now, I can't do this because I got to overlap, I got to be bigger than some things and overlap some other things. Now I have to work a little bit harder. Not much, just a little bit. All right, now, what we're seeing is the interesting case is that if you, do, if you set i of x to be the set of all, you say, u, where u is incomparable, to x, then i of x is not empty. If i of x is empty, you're back in the first case where x is the greatest element of them all. All right, but now here's the neat thing. Observe that i of x is an antichain. This is not true in post sets in general, but it's true when you don't have a 2 plus 2. All right, let's see why. Suppose here's x. Here's down from x. And in the stuff that's incomparable with x, I have a two-element chain. Now, two-element chain, might, there might be lots of stuff in between. I don't care. Now, just keep going up from this guy until you get to some maximal element, x prime. All those points are incomparable with x. All those points. Wait a minute. That x prime looks like it's over a lot of stuff. And what was the rule by which we chose x? The downset was as big as possible. Now, this x prime is over some stuff, at least one point. Now, if this guy is going to be over at least as many things as this one, and this one is over that one, then this guy has got to be over something that he is not. 
Otherwise, x prime has a bigger downset than x. This is just pigeonhole. If this guy is over some stuff that he is not, and he's got the biggest downset in cardinality, then this guy has to be over something that this guy is not. Okay, but now what do I get? What's that? A 2 plus 2. A two-element chain and a two-element chain with no comparabilities back and forth between them. All right. So this little argument completes the proof that I of X is an anti-chain. All right. We're almost done. Now we go back and take P minus X. All right. Here it is. All these intervals are for P minus X. I'm trying to put X back on, but X is incomparable to some things. Let's mark the things that X is incomparable to. Could X be incomparable to that and that? That one and that one? No. The stuff that's incomparable with X is an anti-chain. All the things that are incomparable with X are an anti-chain, and therefore it's an anti-chain of maximal elements. So in this picture, the stuff that's incomparable with X will be things like this and this. Now, there might be other things that are interfering. So X might be incomparable with this guy and this guy, but bigger than those guys. Huh. Do you see a way to fix this? And here's how you're going to do it. Grab the intervals that are supposed to be incomparable with X and stretch them. So grab these two guys and stretch them out to here, just to beyond to where they are. Now, does that, did that, does that, is that okay? Is that still a representation of P minus X? Yes. That's a perfectly good representation of P minus X. Now do you know what to do with X? Now X overlaps these guys that he's incomparable with, but X is bigger than everybody else. Okay. And so that's the proof of Fishburne's theorem. Now, this is a course on applied combinatorics, and this is kind of like the proof that we gave of Dilworth's theorem. It doesn't seem to provide a useful algorithm. So we want to take this proof and turn it into a very, very simple and easily implementable algorithm.